Pole era college football, a phrase that makes many college football fans shake their head in disgust. Perhaps the worst system for determining a champion that sports has ever seen. A system of voting to determine the number one team in the country that always seemed to result in controversy and chaos. But in that chaos, there was a certain kind of beauty that unfolded. A beauty that the sports world may never see again. Today I will be taking you back to the 1983 National Championship to show you one of the best examples of pole era madness. An entire season of college football that came down to one unforgettable day. Going into the bowl games of 1983, there were an unprecedented five teams fighting for the national championship. The number one ranked team was Nebraska. The Cornhuskers were 12-0 and were already considered one of the greatest college football teams of all time. They featured the number one ranked offense in the country that put up a staggering 52 points per game, finishing some games with scores that didn't even seem real. The number two ranked team was Texas. The Longhorns featured the number one defense in the country that was allowing just 8.67 points per game and had held all but one of their opponents to two scores or less. Texas and Nebraska were the only undefeated teams in the country, so if one lost while the other won, the winner would be named national champion. Auburn, Illinois, and Miami were ranked 3, 4, and 5 respectively, each with identical 10 and 1 records. These three teams needed both Texas and Nebraska to lose to have a shot at the national title. Let's take a look at who each team was facing in their respective bowl games. Number 2 Texas had a tough matchup against number 7 Georgia in the Cotton Bowl. Number 3 Auburn also had a tough matchup against number 8 Michigan in the Sugar Bowl. Number 4 Illinois had an easier matchup against unranked UCLA in the Rose Bowl, but probably had the lowest chance of winning the national championship as a result of facing a weaker opponent. And finally, number 1 Nebraska and number 5 Miami were facing each other in the Orange Bowl. The Orange Bowl is held in Miami, so this was essentially a home game for the Hurricanes. Incredibly, every single one of these games was scheduled to play on the same day. January 2nd, 1984, Texas would play at 12.30, Illinois would play at 4, and Auburn, Miami, and Nebraska would play simultaneously at 7 o'clock. I'm going to take you through this day as the live viewer would have experienced it back in 1984, so sit back, relax, and let the mayhem begin. This game was the definition of a defensive slugfest, with a pair of field goals in the first quarter being the only points in the entire first half. The first would come from Texas on the very first drive of the game, and the second would come from Georgia after a great punt return into Longhorn territory. In the second quarter, Texas would march deep into Bulldog territory. Before an important play, Texas head coach Fred Akers desperately tried to call timeout, but no one on the field saw him, and the play resulted in a costly interception. Early in the third quarter, Georgia would make a big stop on third and short, forcing Texas to settle for a field goal. Late in the third, Texas would force a turnover and would find themselves in great field position but once again failed to score a touchdown and had to settle for a field goal. They took this 9-3 lead into the fourth quarter and seemed poised to make it a two-score game with a 40-yard field goal, but the kick narrowly missed wide right. That legendary Longhorn defense kept making big plays throughout the game and seemed destined to outlast Georgia. With just over four minutes left in the game, Georgia was forced to do what they had done all day, punt the ball to Texas. Fortunately for the Bulldogs, this punt would have a different outcome than all the others. We will make the snap in deep punt formation. Back that signal goes up, and it is dropped. And the scramble is on, and Georgia's got the football at the 23-yard line. Georgia's got the football. Curry tried to field it. Moss got the ball. Fourth turnover by Texas. Georgia, trailing by six points, has it first and ten at the, floor, at the Texas 23-yard line with 4.32 to play. That's the fullback, Barry Young. Start the drive of the ball game. Brian Jackson. Brian Jackson out to the 17-yard line. 
Third and four for Georgia. Harris to the left side. Archie short to the right side. Archie in motion across. Last thing has got it. Last thing has got the first down. Last thing up. Trying to get it. Touchdown. Touchdown, last thing. 17 yards. Kevin Butler. It's good. Georgia leads 10 to 9. This game winning touchdown by Lastinger would break Texas hearts in a game where the Longhorns were frankly the better team for 56 minutes. So just like that, second ranked and undefeated Texas had fallen, opening the door to a world of possibilities. On paper, this Rose Bowl game looked to be an easy win for an Illinois team that had beaten three top 10 teams during the regular season. But on the field, it was easy to mix up who was actually supposed to be the number four ranked team in the country. This is the tight end. First down play. Going long to Williams. Rogers hits the for UCLA. Again, Howell in motion. Fake. Throw wide open. That play would have been spoiled. He sprung him for 20. Nelson in the clear. That's going to be a UCLA touchdown. Four rushes, 16 passes. So most of the attack through the air. And there's another one intercepted by Rodgers. He can go all the way. Trudeau to beat. To the 10-yard line, the All-American second interception, Don Rodgers. They haven't had much adversity here in the first half. Leading 14-3, Neuheisel looking for more, and he's got it! Here's a draw to Beverly. And he gets bubbles, and UCLA recovers. They're coming with a full blitz, and Neuheisel goes deep, wide open is Young for another touchdown! From the 15, UCLA looking for more. Good protection. Open again. That's a touchdown. Durrell, his second of the game. By the time it was all said and done, UCLA had beat down Illinois 45 to 9 in a game where it felt like Illinois never really had a chance. And it's strike three it. for Illinois. There goes Donahue onto the shoulders. And he's earned the ride off the field. 7 o'clock was here, and the entire college football world waited in anticipation for one of three scenarios to play out. 1. If Nebraska beats Miami, they are national champions. Simple as that. 2. If Miami beats Nebraska and Auburn beats Michigan, Auburn are national champions. And 3. If Miami beats Nebraska and Auburn loses to Michigan, Miami are national champions. We will look at both games simultaneously, starting with Auburn in the Sugar Bowl, For much of the first half, Auburn just couldn't get going. Their wishbone attack led by superstar Bo Jackson was consistently getting stuffed by the Wolverine defense, and the Tigers just couldn't get on the board. 10 now for Auburn, as Michigan answers defensively, and Campbell drops back, has good protection, throws down the middle, intercepted! It is picked off by Brad Cochran, and Cochran is brought down, and it's Michigan's ball, first down at their 37, Auburn 30. And Steve Smith hands the ball to his tailback, and Rick Rogers gets wide to the sideline. And slides down inside the 15 at the 13 and a first down. And UCLA. Wow. Third down and a yard for a first down. Smith keeps it, sees the goal line, dives, touchdown. Meanwhile, in the Orange Bowl, Miami would surprise Nebraska and the greater college football world with an explosion of points in the first quarter. Takes a look. He throws. 
throws to Dennison. Touchdown, Miami. Where it is second down and 10. And Campbell gives it to Lionel James. James runs to midfield. Uh, James is the, the number three rusher in Auburn history behind Brooks and Chris. But here goes Bowles. Four minutes and 20 seconds to play first quarter. Campbell loses the football. Michigan recovers it. Long one. Low. Right up the gut. Alonzo Highsmith. Ford, even though he's a long kicker. This one's on the way, and this one is right on Five-man defensive front for Michigan. Hits it outside. Ball gets away from Lionel James, and he's going down back on the 11. Number three ranked Auburn behind in the second quarter of this game. Smith runs away from the pressure. Now can't pull loose. Reaching in is Dow Ockman, the nose guard. Racken has a lot of time. Spins it up. At the 12, James. Hit. Ball loose. Michigan's got it. Mark Gray to the bottom of the picture. Steve Smith getting pressure, and he is hammered. The ball pops out of there. When it is Auburn's football. He did not have the arm going forward. Play. Tough down now for the Huskers, third and 11. Turner Gill on the rollout. He's got the strong arm, and he lets it rip. It's intercepted. Jack Fernandez. As we pointed out earlier, John, Turner Gill throws very few, less than 3% interceptions. Albert Bentley runs the ball, and it to midfield. And now Miami has it second and short. Kosar's looking. He's got a man open. Chris Hill. In the second quarter, Nebraska would fight back against Miami while Auburn was approaching halftime against Michigan. This game was going by much faster due to its run-heavy, low-scoring nature. This meant that the Sugar Bowl was set to end much earlier than the Orange Bowl, which could make things interesting for both fans and players. Man, a quarterback is the holder. Kick is up. Low driving and missed it. Gain on that play. Second and eight. Rozier, look at this man. Pop the backfield and off he goes. On five. Heading to the end zone and very close to it was Dean Steinkohler. He's in for a touchdown. I was totally fooled. The best technicians in the world were. And Dean Steinkohler on a trick play goes into the end zone for a Nebraska touchdown. Now we're going to see how it happens. I don't know. Well, I'll tell you what. It's one of those guards around. Every good team has one, but you never figure to throw it. Watch Turner Gill come out. Dean Steinkohler, number 71. He hands it to old Dean. The ball, he didn't hold it. He left it right on the ground. The only way you can give it to a lineman is you got to fumble it. He cannot take it and hand it to him. So what he did is he got it from the center and left it on the ground. Everybody pulled. Everybody read their keys perfectly, and Steinkohler slipped right into the end zone. Staff, Michigan 7, Auburn nothing. Smith straight back on first down, goes down the middle with it. And Sim Nelson, the tight end, dropped the football. Hard block. Third down and two. Campbell to James. James turns it up. And he is short of the first down. And at the 33 for Auburn. Campbell back to throw. Looks for Chris Woods. Going for him. He's down there. And he can't get to it. Michigan's going to stay right in the huddle. They will not come out of it. And we're going to go to the clubhouse at halftime with Michigan leading Auburn by a score of 7 to nothing. And here's... out near the 22. Well, it's A.G. again. This time he pops it. Oh, look out. Caught from behind by Evan Cooper. Penalty flag goes down. I think he may have a face mask coming up. That'll add some more yards. Yeah, they'll mark it on the 21. It'll be 31 yards. He has missed one earlier from 36. This one is up high enough and splits the middle. And Auburn finally gets on the scoreboard. I think that penalty has been refused. Come to halftime at 
the orange ball. Quarter. They get the snap off. Pitch it out to Lionel James. He's got some daylight. And he runs it across the 35. And that's another Auburn first down as the third quarter comes to a close. As Nebraska and Miami started the third quarter, Auburn and Michigan entered the fourth quarter. Both games were one-score affairs, and the national championship hung in the balance. Campbell keeps it. He's got the first down. Well, they're not giving him a very good oh, mark. They Keith. certainly aren't. They're not giving him that a mark at from all. the far side has marked him short. And it, he sure did. That, uh, 45 yard line. Well, oh, they didn't give him anything. It's Michigan for holding. It's first down and 20. And uh, up goes Rick Rogers. Down goes Rick Rogers. The last seven. Michigan 40 goes down at the 39. It's Greg Cole. Start off in the hole to start the third quarter. Kosa gives up to Keith Griffin. He fumbled the ball, and it might be it is Nebraska's ball. A great run by Keith Griffin. This one did. Right on range. Jackson coming back. Campbell keeps it. He's got the first down. Big play, Randy Campbell, Michigan 18. Mike Mann will hold it. Trying to make it 7-6. to six. Not a leg, and it's good. So with 8 minutes and 51 seconds to play in the football game. Second down and 8. Rosario will be firing. strategy has not been what he expected. There goes that lead man out of the wishbone, Tommy Agee, fighting for yardage and still pounding away. And he's up to midfield, and that's a great run. Time remaining in the game, Michigan 7, Auburn 6. Kyle Collins looking around. Give it to Lionel James, going to the outside, got the first down. With five minutes to play in the game. This is Bo Jackson. And he pounds his way on down to the 31. Defending on its 28. Campbell gives the ball to A.G. And he breaks it for a first down inside the 20 down to the 16. Tied, double tied in alignment on second down. They're up the middle it is A.G. And he fights his way to the five. First and goal. Keith, I don't know why they don't use one of their timeouts right here. They got three. Well, they're going to run straight up the middle and try to make the first down. No, they've got to go all the oh, way. They've got to go all the way. It's third yeah. down and goal. Keep it right between the goal posts. It's at least it's coming down to Del Greco if they don't do something here. It's Bo Jackson heading for the corner. And he's out of bounds. He's out of bounds inside the five near the three it'll be fourth and goal with 27 seconds to play and here comes al del greco the sugar bowl had come down to this a 19 yard field goal with potential national championship implications it's up and it's good auburn had done it they had just barely clawed their way back to beat michigan with that game done the entire country was now tuned in to the Orange Bowl. What they were about to watch was the incredible ending to one of the greatest college football games ever played. He hits that blitzer and makes him wish that he was back in Lincoln. It's another one. Here's a throw to Keith Griffin. And he's inside the 20 and down to the 17 yard line. On the line of this game.
the game. Over the top. Jeff Smith is in for a touchdown. He knows, but he likes to go full speed all times. Knox. Second down and nine now, Miami. Hurricanes lead by seven. 440 to play. In the flat. It goes to Eddie Brown and he dives it in. second half. Fourth down now. Here's the field goal attempt. Jeff Smith drills it. Didn't get there. Nebraska will get the ball with 147 to play. Trailing by seven. Irving Pryor. Rod Bellinger saved a touchdown. Second down and eight. 112 to play. Turner Gill with his 28th pass. Irving Fryer. He dropped the ball. chance as the great ones always do to make the catch to put them back in the ball game and he dropped the gimme. Steinkohler picks it up. We'll see if it's a fumble. The Cornhuskers with the longest winning streak in major college football. They've won 22 straight games. 12 and 0 this season. Ranked number one all year. But they're down by seven. With less than a minute left in the game, Nebraska had come all the way back, but head coach Tom Osborne had a tough decision to make. Would he kick the extra point for the tie or go for two and the win? In a fascinating coincidence, he had actually been asked about this exact scenario by a reporter earlier in the week. Here's what he had to say. I hope it doesn't come up. I'll be crucified one way or another on that one. If he did kick the extra point, the game would likely end in a tie, and Nebraska would almost certainly finish number one in the polls as the only undefeated team in the country. But can you really win a national championship by ending your season with a tie? Osborne didn't think so. He was going for the win. This is for the national championship for Nebraska. When the dust settled that night, AP poll voters were looking at a decision between two teams, Auburn or Miami. Auburn was higher ranked entering the day, but their two point win over number eight Michigan felt rather unimpressive. Miami's takedown of number one Nebraska was an upset no one saw coming, as the Cornhuskers were 10 and a half point favorites entering the game. If there was ever a win that would result in jumping another team in the polls, this was the one, and the large majority of voters put Miami at number one. The Hurricanes would be named consensus national champion, as they finished number Number one in both the AP and coaches polls. This jump from number five to number one is the biggest jump to national champion in the entire history of college football. And frankly, Auburn never had a chance. The Orange Bowl absolutely crushed the Sugar Bowl in ratings, as it should have, that game was far more entertaining. And at the end of the day, a poll system is a popularity system. In the days since, many in the media have engaged in a bit of a revisionist history, simply referring to this Orange Bowl as the 1983 National Championship game. It's easy to see why, after all, whichever team won that game was going to end number one in the polls. And it's far easier to call it the National Championship game than the winner might be the national champion depending on other results game. But I think it's important that we don't forget the chaos that unfolded that day. A chaos that allowed the Orange Bowl to be as meaningful and as great as it was. A chaos that resulted in heartbreak for some and joy for others, and a chaos that saw the end of certain eras and the beginning of others. This day saw the end of Georgia's first golden age, a four-year stretch that saw the dogs end with four straight top five finishes, three SEC championships, two bowl game victories, and one national championship. This day also saw the end of Texas's national title window, 
This was the Longhorns third blown chance at a national championship in the past seven years and it was one that seemed to haunt the organization for a long time as it took over 20 years for Texas to get back into national title contention. This day also saw the beginning of the Miami Hurricanes dynasty as Miami would go on to win three more national championships in the late 80s and early 90s to make it four national titles in nine years. This day also saw the beginning of the Miami Nebraska Orange Bowl rivalry with this being the first of four Orange Bowl meetings between these two with the winner of each contest taking home the national championship. Miami would win the first three, but Nebraska would win the last one, which in turn sparked their own dynasty as the Cornhuskers took home three national titles in four years. All of that can be attributed to one beautifully chaotic day, January 2nd, 1984. So that's the end of the story, right? Well, not exactly. I imagine some of you watching this probably thought Auburn deserved to finish number one in the polls. After all, they had won their bowl game, both teams ahead of them had lost, and they were ranked two spots ahead of Miami. And frankly, they were higher ranked than Miami for a reason. Auburn had gone 11-1 with the toughest schedule in the country, and the fourth toughest schedule of all time. They had beaten number 5 Florida, number 7 Maryland, number 4 Georgia, number 19 Alabama, and number 8 Michigan, with their only loss coming against number 3 Texas. Not to mention that that Florida team they beat was one that Miami had lost to, in a pretty convincing 28-3 beatdown. With no undefeated teams at the end of the year, shouldn't Auburn's incredible strength of schedule put them at the top of the polls? Well, if you think so, you're not the only one. In fact, six different polling systems had Auburn as their national champion. So does this mean Auburn are the national champions along with Miami? Well, not quite. During the poll era, there were two major polls, the AP poll and the coaches poll. If a school finished number one in either of these polls, that school would claim the national championship. These polls did not always line up, which resulted in 11 split national championships. However, sometimes a split national championship would happen even when the major polls agreed. Take 1966, for example. Notre Dame would finish number one in both the AP and coaches polls. At the same time, Michigan State would finish number one in four other polls, and they claimed the national championship as well. Now, schools usually don't claim national championships in this scenario, but it has happened plenty of times. So did Auburn choose to claim the 1983 national championship or not? Incredibly, that is not a simple yes or no question, and the answer is quite complicated. Auburn did not immediately claim the national championship, so Miami was the only recognized champion for over 30 years. Then in 2014, an article by collegeandmagnolia.com came out saying that Auburn was now claiming three past national championships, including 1983. However, Auburn University reached out to them and said they aren't claiming the titles, but instead pointing out that the NCAA recognizes those teams as national champions. Hey, Auburn, I heard you're the 1983 national champions. Congratulations. Oh, I'm not saying we're national champions. Ah, uh, my mistakes. You're not the national champs then. Oh, I'm not saying that either. So what are you saying? I'm just pointing out that they said we're national champions. What? Alright, so why would the university make such a ridiculous statement? Well, it's all thanks to their arch rival, Alabama. Alabama is famous for backdating national championships, basically taking any undefeated team from before the AP poll even existed and claiming them to be national champions. Their most ridiculous case of backdating was claiming the 1941 national championship for a two-loss Crimson Tide team when Minnesota went undefeated that year and was clearly the best team. In fact, the AP poll had Alabama at number 20, but they finished number one in the Holgate system poll. So there you go, national champions, I guess. Of course, course, the reason Alabama does this is so they can say they are 18-time national champions instead of 13-time national champions. They have rightfully caught a lot of criticism for doing this, so of course Auburn would want to stay away from doing the same thing and say they only claim legitimate national championships. Essentially, they are trying to have their cake and eat it too by pointing out their previous championship teams while still giving Alabama crap for backdating national titles. Anyway, after they released that statement in 2014, the title sat in that weird state of uncertainty for nine years. Then, in November 2023, several articles came out saying Auburn was now claiming those three national championships, with the university choosing not to say what led to their decision. So seems like the end of the road, right? We finally have a clear-cut answer. Well, no, because if you look at the school website today, it says they only claim two national championships. Do these guys claim these championships or not? What is going on? If you feel like your head's going to explode from trying to understand Polar College football, then go ahead and subscribe. I've heard it helps take the edge off.